And uh, so this morning, I'm bringing the second message in a series called Because I Tithe. And Rachel mentioned last week, Rachel uh, preached a message last week called I Tithe Because. So she just kind of ruined the title of this, this Because I Tithe. And she said, no, I'm going to change it to I Tithe Because. And if you want to know a bit more about this concept, this idea, uh, and what we're teaching about that, I really encourage you to go back and re-listen to that. You can do that through their podcast. You can search Beyond Church on Apple and Spotify, and you can find it there. Or our YouTube channel, again, if you type in Beyond Church, it'll come up. There's maybe two or three in the world, so you, it's easy to find. We'll be there, and you can listen back to that message. I would really encourage you to do that, particularly on this topic, which is um, just such a powerful, transformative topic for families and for homes. And so, Today, I'm bringing the second message in this series, and today the message is called Show Me Your Money. Do you that uh, Jerry Maguire movie? What was that called? Uh, oh, yeah, Tom Cruise movie, Jerry Maguire. What was that called? Jerry Maguire. And uh, he was a sports agent, wasn't he, representing sports people, and he was like, and, and his Cuba Gooding Jr. was his co-star. Show me the money. Show, anyway, what am I talking about? Show me the money. Show me your money. If you want to, you can show me. These days, it's hard to show people your money because you don't actually have it on you. It's in, it's in your bank account. Uh, so you can't just get out your wallet like Brennan Shank stars and just peels out the hundreds. So uh, <laughs> he's good for a loan. <laughs> show me your money and I'll show you your heart. Show me your money and I'll show you your heart. Just a bit of background. In 2016, if you can cast your mind back that far, that was the world was a different place in 2016. Uh, Rachel and I had one of our most difficult seasons as a family in the area of our finances. Uh, we were visiting in a, at a conference where a New Zealand pastor, uh, his name is Paul de Jong, you may know who he is, and he is from a church in New Zealand called Life Church. And uh, he, had, he wrote a book called God, Money and Me. And so he was delivering this uh, session at the conference and he me mentioned his book and spoke about finances. And at that conference, during that message, we both felt, Rachel and I, that God was beginning to call us and stir us to begin a journey of recalibrating our, our whole financial world and begin to apply the principles in that particular book. And so it, it wasn't necessarily that book and it wasn't necessarily even the specific principles that were taught there, but it was the fact that we had made in our hearts a fresh commitment that as a family, we would faithfully and consistently honour God with our finances. And, and just like we did uh, with all other areas of our life, we were very disciplined in a whole range of areas and we weren't undisciplined in the area of our finance, but we just felt so stirred that we weren't honouring God in the way that we felt he was calling us to in that area. So, so over the last eight years, so since 2016 and since making that decision, we have seen, and you can talk to us about this later because there are so many stories, I can't share them all with you right now from the platform, but over those eight or so years, we have seen our financial position as a family change dramatically. And we have never been so financially stable as a family. Now, that even is in the face of some of our most difficult seasons of financial instability. So whilst the world around us circumstantially has often been more difficult than previous financial seasons in our life, we as a family have never been more stable. And we're separating out the natural from the supernatural. And we're separating out from the circumstances from the supernatural. The, 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 the natural order of things from the supernatural order of things. And so when we aligned our financial world with the kingdom financial principles that were taught in the Bible, something brought stability in our life in the area of our money. And we have seen, in addition to that, and if that alone was all we received, that would be amazing. But in addition to that, we have seen, seen more financial miracles in our lives in the last eight years than we've ever seen in our entire life before. So something's happening here. And so most importantly for Rachel and I, in addition to that, we've also been able to put together for our own family biblical principles to help our kids grow into the kind of people that put God first in every area of their life. And not only that, but from 2016, we've also been able to learn how to put a teaching together to teach not just our family, but to teach our church. And I used to be 
nervous and I used to be uh, with, I used to withhold and I used to be uh, uh, insecure about delivering content, messages, preaching on finance. But today, it's my favourite thing to speak about. And that's good and bad because it means that some people are set free, some people are encouraged, some people are inspired, and other people are upset and offended. Thank you, Jesus, for the responsibility of bringing the word of God. And so today I want to preach this message, this Because I Tithe message. And the title is, Show Me Your Money, Not Show Your Heart, because I want to bring this message because my heart is that we would all as a church experience something miraculous in the area of our finances and take away practical tools. But there is an opportunity in this season of of, uh, speaking about finances. There is an opportunity for us to believe again or expect God to be the God he says he is and to deliver financial breakthrough in our lives. So come on, if you've forgotten that you serve a miracle-working God, if you've forgotten that God is in the business of doing things outside the natural order of things, then today is your reminder that your God can turn up and do something that's unexpected, can do something surprising, can bring a miracle to bear in your world. So, so let that discouragement or let that disbelief just break off your life right now and be open to the God of the miraculous, that this could be the day where everything shifts in your financial world. So here's what I want to do this morning. I just really want to ask two questions and then we're all going to have something to eat after the service. Are you ready? Two questions. I've got to fill up today because on Tuesday I'm fasting for a day. So Sunday, Monday, I have to eat enough for three days. All right? Kind of goes against the concept of this message about tithing. But here's my first question. Here it is. Does money matter to God? Good question. Does money matter to God? Now, I've brought some of these stats to the church now for a number of years. So I'm going to test you to see if you've been listening. Now, if you've been in our church for a few years, these, these statistics haven't changed because they're in the Bible. And even in the, all the translations and iterations and new versions they bring out, these numbers are still in there. So I'm not fudging the system here. This is all from like three years ago. So have you been taking notes? This is your chance to prove that you are a studious and faithful attender at Beyond Church. So does money money matter to God? Are you ready, Thomas? Maybe. We know money matters to God because he addresses it more than any other topic in the Bible. Right? It's a lot. But let me ask you this question, which I've asked many times before. In the Bible, how many times do you think it mentions the idea of faith? Luke Hayward is looking back through his notes. (laughs) Come on, Will, we have a note taker. We have a note taker online. You can Google this. How many times does the Bible mention Faith. Is it 50? Is it 100? 215. Yes. Jason Hamilton, front row. Woo! All right. What about references to salvation? Yeah, that's a big deal in the Bible, salvation. How many references? What, 215 for faith? How many for salvation? Any takers? Have I got a bit of maybe 100 mentions of salvation? Anybody be brave? Come on. Let the lion out, as the song says. 500? Too many. 400? Too many. 200, 218. Yes, Jason in the front row. Well done. Woohoo! This guy takes notes and he's bold enough to have a go. 218 references to salvation. 215 references to faith. What about references to love? Oh. One? No, more than one. At least we've got someone having a go in the front row. One. I say, that's it. 121. Higher. Higher than 121. 350. 300 on the dot. References to love in the Bible. Wow. Wow. All right. Now, references to, our, references to managing our money. Does money matter to God? In the Bible, how many times does God talk about money? Got a hundred. Oh, a thousand. That's a big jump from 300, 1,000. Any advances on 1,000? Reese, what do you reckon? 200. Higher than 200. It's higher than 2,000. It's higher than 2,000, 2,058. Thomas Hamilton, well done. It runs in the family, right. 
2,058 references to managing our money. 300 to referencing love, 218 for salvation and 215 for faith. Money matters to God because it is the battleground for our life's priorities. Money matters to God because it is where we do the work to differentiate between what matters most and what matters less. It's a battleground for life's priorities. So God addresses it a lot. It matters to God because money reveals our values. If I wanted to know what you prioritise in your life, I certainly wouldn't ask you because you would lie to me. <laughs> if I say to Jacques, Jacques, what really matters to you? He'd say, Marlies matters to me. Well, anything else? And I'd say, oh, that's beautiful, Jacques. You know, show me your bank, <laughs> bank statements. And Jacques would show me his bank statements. It turns out he likes to go out for dinner on his own sometimes and have pizza. And you know, he, he likes to... His, his bank account statement shows him that he likes her, but he likes to to pay for his mortgage as well, more than he likes his, his wife. I mean, he wants to put away money for superannuation and retirement more than he likes my lease. I mean, Jack, you can tell me you love your wife more than anything else, but what does your bank statement say? You can say to me that you're, I value, really value my health. And when I, I say, oh, that's great. You, you really value your health. And Brendo values his health. And I say, show me your bank statements, Brendo. And he, he's got KFC on the 2nd of August. And, <laughs> KFC on the 14th of August and McDonald's on the 19th of August and he's been to, well. he's been to Burger Fiend as well. Wow. Show me. Now, sometimes I know, I mean, I, I haven't seen the bank statement, but I've had a recently uh, engagement in the family and my daughter got engaged to the young Thomas Hamilton and Thomas Hamilton did what all good young men do when they ask girls to marry them. He bought her a ring. Now, I don't know how much it was, but I bet if I had a look at the bank statement, I would see that he loved Zara. <laughs> because, because money reveals our values. Not what you say, but what you do. Money reveals values. And Jesus knows this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. This is what the Bible says. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, but, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasure... Actually, that's happened to us. We've had a thief break in and steal jewellery from us. Did they steal your engagement ring? Yeah. No, because you had it on. <laughs> your earrings your dad bought you for our wedding day. But, I mean, the Bible says, don't worry about that. Store, for your tre store your treasures where? In heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves don't break in and steal your pearl earrings. Here it is. This is what I want us to look at this morning. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart, everybody say heart, heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And it works the other way around. Your heart reveals your treasure. What is on the inside is exposed on the outside. And Jesus knows this. 1, chapter, uh, John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Don't set the affections of your heart. Everybody say heart. Heart. Don't set the affections of your heart on this world or in loving the things of this world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. The love of money and the love of the things of God are incompatible. Don't set the affections of your heart because there is the, a, a battle going on. It's the battleground for your life's priorities. And we're at war with the, the affections of our heart. The Bible's so clear about this. There's a war at, being waged right now, even in this moment, in your mind, in your heart, in your bank account. There's a war being waged. Where will the value lie? Where will my affections go? Where will I... Ex uh, use and deploy the finances that I've been entrusted. That's the battle that's being waged right now. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, Paul to the young leader, he says this, Loving money is a root of all evils. Some people run after it so much that they have given up their faith. I mean, you, you, we have to be careful because there is a, a fight, a battle of priorities going on right now that we can be drawn, even as a young leader in the church, Timothy. Paul says, hey, be careful because you can move after this, go after this, chase after this so much that it will not just, it will not just alter your values and priorities. It will move you out of relationship with God completely. Craving more money pushes them away from the faith into error. 
compounding misery in their lives. I don't want to be a miserable person, any, not any more than I already am. Luke chapter 16. If I haven't demonstrated this enough yet, let's have a look at this. It's impossible for a person to serve two masters. It's impossible for a person to serve two masters at the same time. You will be forced to love one and reject the other. One master will be despised and the other will have your loyal devotion. And it's no different with God and the wealth of this world. You know, Jesus makes it very clear. It's no different. You must enthusiastically love one and definitively reject the other. There is a war being waged for the affection of the human heart. There is a war being waged and the enemy of God wants your heart, your heart, to be turned toward anything else that's not God. And the Bible teaches us 2,058 times that the red light warning sign, the thing that we have to focus on more than anything else, is our financial world. The Bible teaches us that this is the battleground, this is the war ground for the human heart. So money matters to God. That's the big point. And money matters to God. Why? Because you matter to God and your heart matters to God. He wants the affection of your heart. So here's the second question. If we know that's true, then how do we ensure that God has the affections of our heart? Well, I would love if there was just like a, like a silver bullet, like a secret sauce, like a special trick. To, I, I just kind of think, God, if you just give me some kind of inside lane on how to make sure I don't get drawn away from or outside of your purposes and your will and your call for my life, I want to stay in love with you. I want to stay for you, affectionate toward you and your things and what you've got for me and my life and my family. I want to, what, is there, if there was just one way to deal with this, if there was one way to win this battle, is there like a, is there like a red button in the presidential office I can press and just nuke, you know, Know, this situation and lay it flat so I know that I've got, a, I've got a, 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 a definite or a guaranteed victory in this situation. Is there, is there one way? Can you make it simple for me? Because I'm not strategic. I'm not a deep thinker. If you can just help, is there a biblical kind of mechanism or model or idea that, that, that's been delivered to God's people that could end this war and see this battle for the human heart won for good and for into eternity? Is there a way? Is that your question? That's a good question. Wouldn't it, just like that, wouldn't it? Well, thank God there is a way. There is a silver bullet. It's one word. Are you ready for it? It's five letters. T-I-T-H-E. Tithe. Because I tithe. Simply returning the first 10% of all financial increase in my world to God through the local church. It's the silver bullet. And as I said before, when Rach and I were in that conference in 2016 and we heard that message delivered by Pastor Paul de Jong, we, we were tithers, but we weren't faithful tithers. We were givers and we were generous but we didn't apply this biblical principle like a biblical discipline like everything else. But when we made the shift and aligned that particular biblical principle with the rest of our life, things began to change. And this is why. Because tithing says three big things. Number one, tithing says, and I'll get the team back up now because we're just about to go out and enjoy some time together and some food together. Tithing says God comes first in every area of my life. Tithing says God comes first in every area of my life. It, it doesn't just put God first in your finances. Tithing puts God first in every area of your life because money touches every area of your life. Do not kid yourself and think that money is its own special category outside of the rest of your world. Because when you inhale your first breath of oxygen in the morning, you're doing it under a roof that's been provided for you by finances. Even if it's not your home or a rental, someone's gone to the trouble of building something for you that you live inside of that keeps you alive. When you flick on your switch in the morning and the lights come on, money is touching the light switch. When you get in your car and drive to church, the petrol that you put into the fuel tank, when you put on your nice shirt that your you know, wife bought you, 
you know, money has touched every area of your life. When you want to go to work, when you want to come home, when you want to get something to eat, when you want to go out, when you want to have a meeting, when you want to take your wife out for dinner, money touches every area of our life. We sometimes just super spiritualize our world and think that, you know, our oh, money's just something over there that we don't really need to think about. But tithing says, God, you come first in every area of my life because my financial world touches every area of my life. Number two, tithing says, I trust God with my whole life. I trust God with my whole life. Sometimes we are okay with trusting God with our relationships. Sometimes we're okay trusting God with our ministry life. Sometimes we're okay trusting God with our children. When we give the first 10% of the increase of our financial world to God, it says, I'm trusting you with my whole life, with my relationships, with my kids, with my house, with my future, with my call, with my ministry, with my destiny. I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you. It looks like I'm going to have to rely on you because I wish I could have 100% of all of the increase to do all the things I would like to do. But if I just give you the first 10%, as much as that is and as hard as that is, I know that you will do more with the 90 than I can do with 100 in every area of my life because you come first and I trust you in every way. And third and finally, tithing says, and this is what I'm most excited about, I'm making room for miracles. I'm making room for miracles. If you're in your world right now, in your life right now, and you're, you're, you're believing God for a miracle, Tithing is the kind of thing that just says, well, I know I, I feel like I need 100% of all the resources I've got to do all the things that I need to do. By giving God the first 10%, you invite God into the gap and say, God, I need a miracle in this situation. And if you can have the faith to believe God for a miracle in the area of your world, your finances, which touches every area of your life, let me tell you, you have got the faith to believe God for miracles in every area of your life. If you want to lift your level of faith and believe God for miracles again, then this is a discipline, a principle that changes the order of your belief and says, I'm the kind of person that makes room for miracles. And the truth is that tithing is actually not about money. It is about trust. It is about faith. It is about miracles. Trust, tithing is not about money, just like fasting is not about food. Yes, I'm going to be hungry to, uh, on, Monday, on Tuesday when I fast, but fasting isn't about food. Fasting is about a heart attitude toward God because it's all about your heart. Fasting is not about food. It's about what it makes room for. Tithing is not about money. It's about what it makes room for. Just like the Sabbath, it's not about time. Having a day off a week is not about time. The Sabbath isn't about time, just like fasting is about food and tithing isn't about money. The Sabbath is about trusting God with the six because he can do more with six than you can do with seven. They're acts of surrender. They keep our hearts aligned with God and our faith and trust in God alone. Now, this should challenge us because none of us are perfect. None of us have got it together. None of us have, have got this perfectly sewn up, stitched up. It's a journey. It's a discipleship journey. It's a learning. It's a growing. And our first act of surrender to empower us to do all of those things is a surrendered life to Jesus Christ. It's the first step in a life of meaning and purpose, a life aligned with the principles of the Bible. It's a life surrendered to Jesus. And so this morning in this room, I want to encourage all of us to be the kind of people that surrender to Jesus first. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray over every person. But in particular and firstly, if there's anyone here in this room or online right now or listening back later who has never surrendered their life to Jesus first, I want to invite you to do that now. If you're in the room, raise your hand and say, yes, this is my moment to surrender my life to Jesus. If you're online, you can let us know and we'll follow that up. But if that's you in the room, if you want to raise your hand now, let me know. We're going to pray over you. We're going to pray a prayer together as a church and just invite Jesus into our life. Surrender our life to Jesus. So come on, church. Why don't you pray this prayer after me? And let's this morning as we pray it, just let this be the, the first step in this week, being the week where we surrender our lives wholeheartedly, our whole life to Jesus in every area of our life. So Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. 
You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, church. Thanks, Rach.